Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to my last video for this course. We're going to talk about gradient fields in three-dimensional space. Probably a good place to start is to remind everybody about the definition of a gradient vector. So let's say we have a function f of x1 through xn, uh, which is a function of n variables. Then we defined its gradient to be the function del f equals df dx1, comma df dx2, all the way up to df dxn. And we said that the gradient vector is designed to point in the, in the direction of greatest initial increase for our function f. Um, and, you know, we, we saw this uh, for a function of two variables, f of xy. We saw this for a function of three variables, f of xyz. Um, and it generalizes up to a function of n variables. Now, one other way of looking at del f is to think of del and f as two separate mathematical objects. We've already kind of looked at this, but remember that del is the differential operator, d dx1 comma d dx2 all the way up to d dxn, and then f is a scalar. So we can think of the gradient as a vector times a scalar. Now we can distribute scalars into vectors. So f can be distributed into this vector quantity, and we get the standard definition of the gradient vector that way. So just a slightly different perspective. Back in lesson four, you weren't thinking of del f as two separate mathematical objects. You were thinking of it as one thing, the gradient of f. But actually, we have del and we have f. All right, so let's go back in time here to lesson five, and let's, let's look at a familiar example. So here's a function, f of xy is equal to x plus y over e to the x squared plus y squared. One thing we liked to do with gradient fields was look at the correspondence between a gradient field and a plot of its, the associated surface, f of xy. And what we can see in both plots is that if we follow the direction of greatest initial increase, the gradient vectors, eventually, in this case, we start to approach a sink. And that sink corresponds with a local maximum on our surface. And in this case, if you actually look at the equation and analyze the equation, we actually know it's a global maximum on our surface. But one thing that we got very good at in previous chapters was understanding the correspondence between looking at a plot of the gradient field and understanding how that applies to a plot of the original surface. That's a really useful skill because on the next slide, we're gonna look at a function f of x, y, z that's gonna be very difficult to plot in, uh, that lives in four dimensional space. So I'm not gonna be creating the plot on the right, but I could still understand my function by looking and concentrating on the plot on the left. So here's our example. We have a function f of x, y, z is equal to x plus y plus z over e to the x squared plus y squared plus z e squared. Very, very similar to the, to the function that we had on the previous slide, but this is a four-dimensional analog. And I mean, I mean four-dimensional in the sense that f of x, y, z lives in four-dimensional space. Uh, the good news, though, is that the gradient of f of x, y, z, you know, that's always in one dimension lower, uh, that lives in three-dimensional space. So we can plot the gradient field for f of x, y, z. Here's a plot of it. And that's a 3D gradient field. Now, how do we interpret this? Well, I want to think of f of x, y, z as a temperature function. So I'm moving around in three-dimensional space, and the temperature that I'm experiencing at those different points in space is changing as I move. And so the gradient vector is going to point in the direction of greatest initial temperature increase. And when I, when I locate a little local maximum, like you could see one right here, um, I would experience that as a little hot spot. Or a, a local minimum would be a little cold spot. And so in this scenario, we can kind of get a handle on a, a surface that actually lives in four-dimensional space, but we're understanding how it works using our understanding of gradient fields and three-dimensional space, which is pretty cool. Since this video is about talking about gradient fields in three-dimensional space, one thing we are probably going to want is a 3D gradient test. And the best way to develop a 3D gradient test is to talk about 
how we did the gradient test in two-dimensional space. So what I want to remind you guys of is if the rotation of a vector field in two-dimensional space is equal to zero, then we have a gradient field. Um, on top of that, the other thing we want to uh, say is that it's also a really good idea to check that our vector field has no singularities. Um, because if we want our gradient field to behave in the way we expect a gradient field to behave, we want to make sure that we don't have any singularities, and singularities can kind of throw a wrench in the works. All right, so let's look at the equivalent version for a 3D gradient test. And in this case, instead of saying that the rotation of our vector field is equal to zero, um, our 3D gradient test is that the curl of our vector field is equal to zero, zero, zero. And that's kind of a logical extension because um, if, we, if the 2D gradient test requires us to be irrotational, then the 3D gradient test should also require our vector field to be irrotational. Well, that means no rotation on the YZ plane, irrotational on the XZ plane, and irrotational on the XY plane. So setting the curl of our vector field equal to 0, 0, 0 should make some intuitive sense for a 3D gradient test. And just like the two-dimensional case, it's also a really good idea to check that your vector field has no singularities, because that's going to guarantee that your gradient field is, be, is going to behave in the way you expect a gradient field to behave. All right, so how do we prove this is true? Well, uh, one direction of this proof is pretty straightforward. So um, you can actually do this computation yourself. You could take out some scratch paper, or you can use Mathematica. Um, so let's say that we have a vector field that is that we know to be a gradient field. So we have some function f of x, y, z, um, such that the gradient of f equals you know, the standard definition, df dx, comma, df dy, comma, df dz. Well, we need to prove that the curl of this gradient field is equal to 0, 0, 0. And you guys can actually crunch the numbers on this. Um, what you would do is compute del dot, or del cross del f, or um, del cross the gradient of f. And so you're going to have i, j, k across the top of your 3 by 3 determinant. Then you're going to have del across the middle of your 3 by 3 determinant. And then you're going to have um, the gradient of f across the bottom row. And when you compute this 3 by 3 determinant, you're going to get 0, 0, 0. And that, that proves half of the theorem. That's the easier half of the theorem to prove. So now we should talk about properties of gradient fields in two-dimensional space or in three-dimensional space. Um, the thing is that, is that the 2D case is a little bit more intuitive um, because you could kind of imagine the whole hiking trail analogy. So remember that the net flow of a gradient field along a simple closed curve is equal to zero. And our intuition for that was if we, are, if we start at base camp on a mountain and then we go for a hike, and we return to base camp at the end of the night, our net change in altitude on that hike is zero. Um, we started at the same altitude that we ended at. Our net change in altitude is equal to zero. And for that reason, the net flow of a gradient field along a simple closed curve is equal to zero. Uh, the good news is this extends directly to three-dimensional space. So in the 3D case, if we have a vector field that is a gradient field with no singularities, um, and C is a simple closed curve, then the net flow of, gr of a gradient field along a simple closed curve is equal to zero. It's the same exact concept. And again, we could write it in three different ways. We could write that the integral of field dot tangent is equal to zero. We could write that the integral of m dx plus n dy plus p dz is equal to zero, or we could just write it as a sentence. The net flow of a gradient field along a simple closed curve is equal to zero. Now our intuition for why this is true, um, again, think about that temperature analogy. If you are at base camp and it's 70 degrees, and then you go on a hike around the mountain and you come back to where you started, assuming that temperatures, you know, stay constant in the system, you're back to base camp and it's 70 degrees again. Or if you're in the swimming pool at Friend High School and you're at a part of the swimming pool that is, uh, I don't know, let's say 67 degrees, and then you go for a swim underwater and then you swim back to where you started, the temperature is back to 70 de uh, 67 degrees. Your net change in temperature is equal to zero 
um, as you traverse that closed curve. Again, we could prove this. Uh, you prove it using Stokes' theorem. So uh, suppose that your vector field is a gradient field, then we already know that the curl of that gradient field is equal to 0, 0, 0. And we just invoke Stokes' theorem. It's, it's actually the same as the shortcut we saw previously. So we say that our path integral along our closed curve is equal to the surface integral of curl dot top unit normal, then plug 0, 0, 0 in for the curl, and we get 0. The net flow of a gradient field along a simple closed curve is equal to 0. And again, make sure to refer back to that temperature analogy. The idea is if you start and end at the same point in 3D, your net change in temperature from, that, uh, from your starting point to your ending point, which is the same as your starting point, that net change in temperature is equal to 0. Now, remember, this doesn't work for any vector field. Um, it, you can't just arbitrarily choose a vector field and have this be true. The key is that we have a gradient field. This is a property of gradient fields in three-dimensional space. Um, another thing that we can extend to three-dimensional space is path independence. The net flow of a gradient field along any two curves that start and end at the same points is the same. And remember, we, we had this really nice hiking trail intuition for it um, when we were talking about the, uh, the case for a, an f of x, y. Um, so in this sort of scenario, we said, oh, OK, so if you go from point A to point B, then your net change in altitude is some, you know, some fixed value. And then if your friend also goes from point A to point B, but their compass is broken and they go on some crazy winding path, but they still go from point A to point B, um, their net change in altitude is the same as your net change in altitude. The net flow of a gradient field along any two curves that connect the same starting and ending points is the same. That's path independence. That property also applies to a 3D gradient field. So, you know, as long as we don't have to worry about any singularities. So let C1 and C2 be two different curves that share the same starting and ending point. Then we can invoke path independence. The net flow of our gradient field along C1 is equal to the net flow of our gradient field along C2. And again, this is something that we can prove. Um, since our vector field is a gradient field, the net flow of the vector field the net flow of our vector field along any closed curve is equal to zero. So we can join C1 and C2 into a closed curve, right? If, if this is C1 and this is C2, if you join together C1 and C2 into a closed curve, uh, the net flow of our gradient field along that closed curve that we've just created is equal to zero. So let's, let's do it. The net flow of our gradient field along our closed curve is equal to zero. Oh, but then we could break apart um, our path integral into two path integrals. The net flow of our gradient field along C1 minus the net flow of our gradient field along C2 is still equal to zero. Now the minus sign is because I'm traversing C1 in the usual direction, but then I need the opposite of C2 in order to have a counterclockwise parameterized curve C. So C2 has to be reversed for this to work. And then just move uh, this integral right here to the right side of the equation and we get path independence. All right, and so there's how we prove that we have path independence for a gradient field, for a 3D gradient field. Finally, guys, I'd like to point out that everything we just talked about with path independence was predicated on your gradient field having no singularities. So a gradient field with no singularities is path independent. One thing you should look out for on triad problems, on litchi problems, on quiz problems, are those kind of edge cases where you have a gradient field, but there are singularities. And in the case that there are singularities, there's going to be more subtlety in the problem. Three-dimensional space is interesting, so certain times we're going to be able to deal with singularities and retain path independence. And in other scenarios, um, the singularities are going to be um, something that we can't deal with and we're going to lose path independence. So always look out uh, for a vector field that has singularities 
and really try to think about the subtlety of the particular situation that you're working in. Um, I'll have some more content for you guys going forward this chapter, talking about how to deal with singularities. But in terms of lecture notes, this is our last lecture of the year. So congratulations and good luck on your triad problems.